Welcome to uh, our vision series for Seagraph 2021. Uh, today, I'm talking with Matthias Royvik uh, from Rodeo Effects. We're going to be talking about rigging today uh, and some of the cool things that Matthias has been doing uh, with some of the more recent Maya releases with rigging. Uh, just briefly, I'm Will Telford. I'm a senior product owner at Autodesk. Uh, and I, I work on uh, rigging and USD for, for the Maya team. Uh, but the man of the hour here is actually uh, uh, Matthias. Uh, Matthias, thank you for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate having you here. Uh, we're very impressed with all the work you've done with our tools. So thank you for that. Thank you for having me. It's been fun exploring them as well. So yeah, it goes both ways. So you are a lead rigger at Rodeo, and that's that's relatively uh, a new, relatively new position for you uh, at Rodeo. You you joined Rodeo recently, right? Yeah, I'm just coming up on six months now. So it's been it's been fun uh, getting to a new city as well, and um, really I've finally gone into the office now. So it's really nice to actually work uh, in a new office. Like the the office is really lovely as well. So. Yeah, it's been uh, moving in the pandemic and everything has been a weird one, but yeah. Um, so can you tell us a bit about um, just your career in general? Like how, how did you how did you get into rigging and how did you break into the industry? Like what, 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 what's that look like for you? So for me, it kind of started out when I went to 3D school in Norway. I, I discovered, I stumbled on like Maya 8.5 um ages ago and then really fell in love with the program and then decided to find like a 3d school in norway um after school uh, i ended up uh, starting as a, a runner in at frame store london um and then eventually after that managed to get my way into mpc starting out as a rigger there um, and leaving there as like a lead rigger and then taking the uh, turn into games and so for the last kind of two years i've been working for ninja theory before then coming to Montreal to work for Rodeo FX. I like to say that a lot of riggers are failed animators um, because it's like, you know, everybody starts out wanting to do rigging, right? But then you're like, there's always a rig that breaks, right? And then there's always gonna be that one person that figures out what breaks, right? And you're just kind of stumbling down this kind of rabbit hole of figuring out things and kind of poking at different things. Um, and with that as well, I, I ended up doing like a bit of like, um, helping out training people as well when I was at MPC. And for me, I really love that kind of part because it just means that I have to know what I'm talking about. So even if I'm just talking about like some very basic things, I, you always kind of go back and like, do I, do I know what I'm talking about? So I always really enjoy like that part of it. And yeah, I'm teaching an online course at CGMA now. And it's been really, it's been really fun to kind of delve a bit deeper into some of these kind of topics with students. And it's always fun when you see it, like kind of click for them and be like, oh, wait, I can do this? I was like, yes, you can. You can always tell if you're talking to a rigger because if you're not talking to a rigger, I think they absolutely despise rigging. Like they, like they respect it. They respect the people that do it and they know they need it, but they don't want to be anywhere near it or solving it themselves. Whereas riggers, you know, they, they absolutely love it. Like I, I love everything about it. It's, it's, it's hard not to love the problem solving and get in there. So it, it, it's pretty clear early on, I think, whether you're a, a rigger or not, or whether you're destined to be a rigger, it's whether you really like taking on those kinds of, of, of problems, which I, I find fascinating personally. And I can tell by the work you do that you, you probably clearly have the same passion for that. It's not problems, Will, it's challenges. <laughs> it's, challenges. it's not problem solving, it's challenge solving. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, that doesn't sound as good, does it? <laughs> All right, well, that's awesome, man. So, um, well, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about. Uh, so we've we've been making a push into a more procedural, topologically independent way of working uh, in Maya. Uh, we started that push with Maya 2020. Uh, where we introduced things like the original geometry plug and offset parent matrix and the proximity wrap. Uh, and we continue that in, in 2022 with improvements to you know, GPU evaluation. Uh, we've introduced this component tag system, this fall off system, morph to former solidify. Like we're really pushing into a lot of these uh, 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 topologically independent procedural type, type workflows. Um, and so 
I, I've seen you grab hold of some of these features and just really run with them. So I, I wanted to kind of get get your your thoughts on them and 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 see see what sort of workflows this is unlocking for you. I mean, I, I will show your uh, your the screenshot here of your web page. Uh, you have a, a great web page with some good articles on there, and I think people can see there's one on there for my original shape, and then there's an overview of the fall off. So it's clear that you dove into these and really wanted to explain them to people. So uh, can you talk a bit about what these things are, are, are doing for you and your workflows? Yeah, like even even kind of before the work that you, you've all started kind of doing now is like having just the understanding of like something like the org shape in Maya, I think is something that just opens up a lot of possibilities because it's one of those things that being able to kind of rig something once and then kind of easily update it um, is a really powerful way of working, right? And there's been plenty of times when in production or something, you've had a, a facial rig where it's been like, there's just been like a super tiny tweak. And instead of having to rebuild the whole facial rig, you could update the org shape and just kind of get that slight difference. And that's something that's very powerful. And it's one of these things where I think people miss or like they don't get that Maya actually is procedural. It's just kind of, it's not as procedural as they might want, or it's not as exposed all the time, but it's really understanding that as soon as you jump into like the, the node editor and start looking at the connections and start seeing the, the data that flows through Maya, um, as soon as you start through that, you can manipulate that as much as you can. And that's pretty much what I talk about in these kind of examples here in the org shape, how you can use that to do model updates, how you can save file sizes, not having duplicated geometry. Um, and also in the sculpt layer tweak node, just seeing how you can kind of manipulate with the, the tweak node and passing this data through. Um, and then like all of this kind of now culminating into like the, the kind of fall off system that you've been implementing now is really just allows you to, it unlocks that kind of final piece of the puzzle where it's been like a lot of deformers are dependent on kind of painted weights. But now with the fall off system, that's gone. You can, you, you're kind of freed from that. So like it just allows you to kind of like play and explore and not necessarily just that, but also work more efficiently and really just kind of save you time in, in production. I figured we can just do a quick thing of like, just showing a quick um, demo of like what the fall off system actually gives you. Perfect. So I've just got like, I'm just making a simple plane here and I'm adding a cluster and I'm just gonna move this cluster up like five units. And what I can do now is that if you open up the attribute editor, uh, you, and if you go on the actual deformer, you can go underneath the former attributes and you now have this nice little new UI here. And what I can add in is I can right click to a primitive fall off here. And we actually see this like spike here. So actually what we have is we got like this little sphere that we can now use to actually dictate where we get all of the kind of weighting. So normally the only way you could get something like this would be with like a, a soft mod that you would hack, but now you can just get it with directly using a cluster and moving around these. And the cool thing about this is as well, uh, I can go still go in and change my topology here. So it's all just kind of flowing through nicely and it's updating those weights on the fly. Whereas if I had painted those before, I, I wouldn't be able to do that, right? Um, and with this as well, like if I jump back in here and now I just have one kind of fall off in here, right? Uh, and that's not really going to give me too much here. But if I go in and I do assign a blend fall off, you can now see it's a blend fall off here. And if I jump in, that means I've got like this little UI here now where I can right click and I can add in another primitive fall off. And you've got different modes happening here. So what I can do is for instance, let's say that the second one is actually subtracting the values. So you can see it's actually now going in and it's going to remove the influence that we're getting here. And you can see even here now, it's, it's giving us kind of negative values. Mm -hmm. So just with this, you can start to really play and expose where you want your deformers and have that like procedurally happen as well. But even if you're not changing your topology or you need any of this, just having these kind of simple tools where you can expose different things saying like, oh, in this area, now I want this cluster to happen or I want this delta mush to happen in this area, brings a lot of power to the table and just making more optimized rigs and kind of solutions to it. 
Yeah, and I think, you know, you, you show the topology and dependence. I think one thing that's interesting about this is, uh, I don't know if you want to pop up in the node editor, but yeah. this graph, this creates a graph that, um, that, that, that you've built here. And this, this, the, the graph of this fall off network can be used for any deformer in this deformation chain. And it can also be used for any other geometry because it's not evaluated until you get to the deformer. Uh, so it's not just topology independent for that geometry, but that means you can reuse this weight function across different uh, different meshes, which is also the power of the system. Yeah, and I could even go in and even if I just have this kind of blend fall off in here already, I could duplicate out my my geometry here. And if I just uh, scale that down, I can just do that to zero, and I could freeze my translate here. And if I just delete the cluster, I could change this and have a completely different kind of weighting here. So if I select these two, if I have a cluster that just goes across both of these, you know, I can go in, I can get my cluster and we can now just see like for each of these, we now have these, but I can basically go and add in the blend fall off for both of these. And now we have those exact same weights across multiple geometries and it's on just one deformer. And in the multi-resolution pipeline, this is absolutely a lifesaver. You don't have to remember to go in and kind of copy weights. You don't have to worry about like transferring correctly between meshes, it just works. If right now, you just have those kind of connections feeding straight into a deformer. So okay. it's sort of just happening on a deformer level. So okay. again, this kind of goes back to a, this thing not being a bit of a black box. Because what I have here is I have a bunch of cubes. So if I just hide this plane, so you can see I have a bunch of cubes here. And basically, the scale y of these is being driven. And it's being driven as I move this around here. So you can see as I kind of move this kind of whole primitive around here, the primitive fall off, that's scaling up these kind of values for the cubes here. And how that's happening is that we're basically taking the the fall off the the kind of weight function that we're calculating here and we're passing that into a fall off eva now the fall off eva will basically give you per vertex weights for the geometry that you're passing in and so i'm not going to show it now but each of these per vertex weights feeds directly out into each of those kind of cubes scale y so this so this fall off eval it takes a function it takes it takes a, a fall off network and and that weight function and it evaluates it against a shape, and its output is a traditional wait list, which is what Maya has always used for dive deformation. <coughs> so now you yes. have this 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 wait list, um, and you're using that then to turn around and drive these cubes, right? Exactly. And you like you could put this out to anything. You could have uh, weights driven by this. You could feed this into whatever you want, uh, and it just allows you to basically use any of these kind of things that you got going on here and just kind of drive some values because that's that's the the main thing that i think is also just really important to think about these things is like yes it will probably mostly be used with the formers but you can push this out to whatever you want you know like that's a that's the power of like the the kind of connections on the graph in maya is that even even if you got like a node that's like doing uh, you know blend colors well blend colors is three values you can use that to like blend uh, an elbow fkik right so it's all about kind of thinking about taking out this data passing it back in and kind of manipulating and using it for what you need and make cool stuff now, I, I love this out of the box example this the fall of a vowel was originally created to evaluate these things to generate a wait list to help drive deformate deformers that weren't yet uh, uh fall off compatible to derive like legacy deformers who weren't updated for that. But you saw that, you saw that wait list and like, hey, I can use that for, I can use those values to drive anything. And that's, again, this speaks to um, this kind of module based, taking black box things, breaking them up into these reusable modules of components so that they continue to do what we intended them to do. But you can take that output and use it for anything. And here you've shown this kind of motion graphic effectsy kind of utilization of this fall off network, which is, I think, absolutely brilliant. That's really cool to see. Awesome. Man. Yeah, and, and this is stuff that like I've used in production before, similar tools. And it's been stuff that's been super useful because you can drive so many different things about it. Um, you like 
I'm, I'm all for changing. I don't know if I use the term right, but changing the domain of like what you're working with, you know, having cages that you can use for wrapping or like painting yeah. on low resolution, transferring that to a high resolution, thinking like super statically about things. I don't think it's really useful for anybody, yeah. but thinking about like, Hey, I can take this out here. I can transfer it through this, uh, then smooth it, pass it back in, combine things. And that's really just going to open up a, a big toolbox for you to work with. And there's a lot of advantages to kind of doing indirect deformation, right? Like going through layered deformation systems, using cages, lower res cages to drive higher res geometries and making sure that you're only incurring binds and deformation costs when you need to in the process, right? Like if, if you don't need the fidelity, don't, don't operate on a high res mesh, operate on a low res mesh until you need that fidelity. And it makes the whole process easier and faster, makes it for more efficient. Rate. So that's, that's pretty cool, man. Yeah, absolutely. So now we just kind of looked at these kind of simple examples. So yeah. one of the cool things as well is with the, uh, the new kind of uh, proximity wrap that's been added as well. That allows for a lot of really kind of nice things as well. Um, I believe it was in 2022 that you added in the ability to um, bind it to like a skeleton as well and uh, to kind of yeah. drive that. So, so proximity wrap shipped with Maya 2020 um, and it shipped with a mode called cluster mode which allows it to take a matrix to drive deformation. Uh, but what it did not ship with was any workflows to build a cluster mode based proximity wrap. Um, and if you look at the network of constructing one, it's not something you probably want to construct by hand, particularly if you're dealing with a full character skeleton. Uh, so it was in 2022 that we updated the Maya bind tool so that when you, when you create a skin bind, there's an option at the bottom where you can say, what type of node to use, to use a skin cluster or to use a proximity wrap. And so you can set the proximity wrap and it will do the bind and it will set it up, but it will use the proximity uh, wrap instead. And that uses it in cluster mode. So that's when that workflow shipped with uh, proximity wrap. Um, gotcha. The cluster mode is there in 2020. The, the, the one thing is, is in 2022, you can get a one-to-one -one, um, uh, deformation with the skin cluster, which we couldn't get before because in 2020, uh, the the there's a fall off rate that needed to be exposed uh, to the user. And I think the fall off rate was linear. It was like a value of mm -hmm. one. And in order to match skinning, you needed to be able to specify fall off rate of two. So also in 2022 is when we exposed that fall off rate. So if you, you can set something up to mimic a skin cluster in one uh, in, in, in 2020, but you won't get a per vertex match with, an, with a skin cluster with the exact same weighting. Whereas in 2022, you will get that because of the fall off rate. You can now set uh, appropriately. So you get the same algorithm effectively. Absolutely. Yeah. So just a quick shout out, like this model is um, done by a friend of mine, Damien Gumino. I hope I say cool. his name right. If not, he's going to hound me. Um, <laughs> but I just uh, want to do like a quick little show of like, this was one of the things where it's, um, I think it's pretty interesting to have the proximity wrapping driven by these kind of joints here now. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to just select these kind of uh, joints here. Actually, I'll probably just do these two just to kind of make it a bit easier here now. Uh, I'll go skin, bind. I'm going to do selected joints and I'm going to do the proximity wrap. So what we get now is we kind of get this whole thing here now. So right now we don't really have, like we can't right click and kind of paint it, but what we can do is we can go back in and kind of have our, um, the, um, and control this whole proximity map by using the uh, components, sorry, the, the, the weight functions there. So we can see by default, we actually get a component fall off and transfer fall off that basically kind of mimics what you get with a, a typical skin cluster when you do like a normal bind. But we can go in and kind of take these and kind of drive these as we want. And uh, so what I'm going to do is I'll go and I'll just get rid of this and I'll add in, first off, I'll just do a uniform fall off. And correct me if I'm wrong, but the uniform fall off is just like a flood value weight that gets set. Correct. Correct. We primarily created it to work in the blend fall off to work with different compositing operations inside the blend fall off. Exactly. So that's what I will be doing now as well. So what I will have is I will have a primitive fall off that is basically like my elbow weight. 
Um, so we'll take this up here and I'm just going to make that a bit larger. And I'm just going to make sure that I kind of use the values here that we have to kind of shape that primitive a bit. So what I just want is I want this kind of primitive fall off to define the area that the elbow joint should be driving. So I'm just going to do something like that and I'll make sure to change the start so that it's a bit larger here as well. And what I will do now is I will just add this in here. Let me just see here. I'll take this. And one of the kind of key things to kind of know about here now, as soon as you start going into the proximity wrap and you want to like have these kind of follows play into this, is that you need to know which joint you're kind of representing here with each of them. So for me, looking at that, I just look at the kind of drivers here. Uh, so if I'm just going to hide that quickly now. So you can basically see that the left arm, that's our driver zero. The forearm is our driver one. So I basically want this elbow to control the second weighting here. And what I need to do now as well is um, to get the weighting for my whole body. Uh, I'm going to make basically have the, uh, the blend fall off. I'm going to have just a default weighting of one. I believe that should just be fine to then pass in my elbow into the target. So go in here, add that in. And what I want to do here now is I want to add that in as a subtract so that I basically have now something that kind of covers the entire body, but except for the elbow area. So as soon as I have that, I will now just connect that blend fall off into the driver weight function, sorry, the weight function. Is that not opening? Oh, uh, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to probably just do that there. And then I'm going to copy this here in the script editor, just so that I can push that around. And I'm just going to do that quickly here. I want to put that to zero. So we can now see that now that I have this, we can basically use this to kind of specify the area that we want to kind of add this. So as I'm moving this, we see that the weights are actually interactively changing, which can also be really great for just, you know, manipulating weighting just to see them real time as well. Even like if you're in a pose or something, we can see now that basically I'm not covering the fingers well enough. So I can just kind of push this a bit more, scale out and I'm down here. Now, I still need more practice with actually getting like proper weights with this, but um, it's something that's really, really kind of just quick to set up and play with. And you can see that we now have this and I can see, you know what, I actually want my weighting, if I want my weighting to go further down um, or if I want it to kind of soften up that weighting here a bit more. Oh, wait, I might not have on the proximity wrap. I probably have to do, yeah. Um, up my kind of drivers as well. So they kind of interpolates more nicely between those. So we just have all of this kind of stuff here now. So yeah. And like one thing that I've kind of been playing with this as well is like sometimes it can be a bit awkward just to like have one of these kind of match like an arbitrary shape that would be um, like the form. And this is where you could use the blend fall off to have multiple simple primitives, combine them to one weight and kind of pass that in, right? Sure. So there's a lot of ways that you can kind of set this up and kind of have one thing that will match. So for example, if you've got like a bunch of different characters that have the same kind of position, you can use this weighting for all of them now. Yeah. Or yeah, if you, you know that, geometries. exactly. Um, or if you know that, for instance, you all of your characters are in the kind of same uh, kind of pose, but they might be scaled differently. The really nice thing about this now is that your weighting is now a transform. So you can very easily kind of change this around. If you have like a joint layout, even if it's for different characters, you can already get like starting weights if you have like a nice kind of node network that you start to set up for this. And what you kind of mentioned as well with like kind of starting the, uh, changing the original thing here. So if I go, <coughs> apologies. Um, if we look at the actual kind of the original geometry here now, um, Anything that we kind of do to this, if I go in, if I start to like extrude on this, 
we can see that the this just works still. Like I can go in and I can just kind of increase my resolution and we can just kind of change these deformations. Of, of course, we still need to be within the kind of fall off area, but I can, oh, if I just go back here and if I select my kind of org here, I can still go in and I can kind of modify these things here. Uh, oh, yeah, if I had that connected up nicely, well, we can basically- so I think one of the things worth pointing out though is this, this isn't just point pulling passing through. You actually just changed the topology. When you did that extrude, there are now new faces. You updated membership, you added updated deformation. Um, you know, if this, yeah, you just smooth there. So you can see the subdivision, you actually change yeah. the topology and your deformation continue to work. That's, that's the, that's the real strength. I think of these, you know, that's why we call them topologically independent, you know, deformation, right? Because yeah. the topology can change if you need it to. Exactly. And like, as long as, you know, this is one of the things that can often come up in, in production is that you might still, you might have like an approved shape but you might go backwards and forwards and like, oh, we need uh, we need high resolution to do like some nice kind of skin simulation wrinkle. You know, this can pretty much almost bypass rigging now with the right pipeline. Yeah. And for me, like the, the amount of like times that I spent updating models, even if it's just like a quick copy bind and saving out a new rig, you know, it, it just kind of adds up. And especially if you if you end up having like a lot of background characters, you might have like 10, 15 different models and that can be like sitting a rigger down for a day and taking up valuable time and just being like, click, save, click, save. So there's a lot of really things here that you can do to really kind of push. Because for me, this isn't just like, oh, rigging. You need to look at this from like a pipeline standpoint from Absolutely. start to end, right? Yeah. You want an entirely data-driven pipeline. You want to be able to change the inputs. You want to be able to flow through your, your, your entire pipeline. Absolutely. Yeah. And with like the least amount of, and input as long as there's not anything that needs to really change, right? If you're just kind of updating the topology or like adding more kind of subdivisions, as long as you don't have anything in rigging that needs to like really change with that, you should just go through, right? This can be used for LODs, use one deformation chain, multiple LODs. It can be used for costume changes. It can be used for character variations. Any number of things can be passed through without necessarily needing to update the deformation chain. You can accommodate multiple meshes. So. That, that's, that's what we're going for. And it's, it's, it's cool to see you being able to leverage that here. One of the kind of nice things to, we can kind of leverage with this now as well is what I've done here is I've kind of taken that kind of model and um, pushed into this whole thing of um, having kind of being able to kind of change all of this. So what I've done is I've uh, actually made like a kind of custom geometry. I've taken the, the kind of default human that comes with Maya and kind of matched it to the, the rhino shape. Okay. And what, I'm, what I've done here is I've just kind of skinned this with a proximity wrap. Um, and I've just got an, like sort of an animation scene here. So where I'm going through and you can see I haven't really updated the weighting for this one. But one of the cool things that this kind of allows now is because this um, already has the kind of component fall off and the component fall off keeps the kind of original shape when you bind it and it keeps that kind of original data. That means that with this component fall off and this transfer fall off already built in, we can do things like going in here and saying like, let's say this is the published model, uh, but we can change it to like the working model. And this will now, the only thing that it's doing is it's just changing, if I can move this window, is that it's literally just changing the, the reference path. So this is still, referencing in the rig, but in the rig model, we've got a reference to a model file and it's just updating this. So that's just like the whole thing. So this didn't have to go through rigging. It didn't have to go through anybody. This could be, you know, if a, if a, a CD supervisor wants to test a new model before publishing it, test it on some shot animation or anything, this can just go straight into here as well. So the only thing that changed here, just to, to clarify, this is simply a file pointer to the mesh. Everything yep. else, exact same rig, exact, exact same weights, nothing changed. We just, we're just pointing to a different mesh, right? So you, you can see this, here, this is the whole code of that little UI that I had, where the only thing that it's doing is it's changing the reference for the mo Rhino model. And it's just changing from the published to the working, or I can go in and I can say, 
a custom model, I can go in and do like another one here and it will just do that. So because it's just like doing that stuff live here now, um, it's not necessarily like the way that I would probably recommend doing it for like, um, like a full production model, but being able to just go in and kind of like test this and just kind of mm -hmm. click some buttons again, without having to go through rigging, you, you don't have to go through rigging just to test things with the, the actual rig. I think it's super powerful. So now you can see we've got like this guy here now, and now he's got like a bunch of kind of extra clothing that's going on here now. That's also, you know, following the same deformation because it gets that kind of weighting already. It just that's works. Really cool, man. Of course, so, I would have to go in and fix the deformations here a bit. <laughs> well, yeah, but I mean, like, I think you fix the deformations for this guy and they're going to work on the other resolutions, right? Like if you have a higher fidelity model, you would yeah. probably want to build most of your deformations to accommodate the higher fidelity, but then you can pass a low res mesh through it and you're going to get very good results and, and results that you probably don't have to clean up. Yeah, and you can you can start to take like decisions based on what you already have, you know, like um, just with this basic skinning, would that be enough for the character? Or can you you can take it into shots and see like, oh no, we need to fix here. Instead of kind of building too much up front, you can take, you know, um, actually like informed decisions on where to like really focus your time as well. And yeah, it's like this character is like 300,000 verts. And the original published one is 8,000. So it's just copying that kind of like deformation between there and That's straightforward. Really cool, cool. So one of the, the things here as well with kind of going through and having the kind of proximity set up using like the falls, um, I think some people might have, you know, a bit of like hesitation getting into them. Um, but I still think showing with the kind of workflow that we, that I kind of demonstrated with and being able to kind of switch between the, the kind of different um, topologies and everything and just have, have that happen on the fly is still super powerful. And I think that's a big advantage over the skin cluster, even if you just want to go in and, and like actually paint your own weights. And okay. there's, there's one way that you can go in and actually for your kind of proximity wrap, go in and, and paint them as if it was a skin cluster. Um, so, so before you jump in, I guess one thing I want to touch on is, um, you know, we, we talked about the fact that we've shipped some functionality, but not always workflows that sit on top of it. And so we put in the plumbing for some things um, and didn't have the opportunity to really get through and build a workflow on top of it. So while we've set up the proximity wrap to be able to consume these falloff systems. And one of the types of falloffs it can consume is a component falloff, which is the weight painting falloff. Uh, what we didn't do, even though that plumbing is there, what we didn't do is put a weight painting workflow on top of that. And what you've done is you've gone and you've found a way to leverage the skin cluster to use its paint weighting workflows to drive a proximity wrap, right? That's what exactly. you're gonna show us? Cool, all right. Because that's pretty much one of the things that um, to kind of just I like how I stumble into it. a lot of the things that I was kind of playing with was with the skin cluster, just because um, in one of the kind of examples, uh, I believe you were showing how you could take a component for, or like take a, a skin cluster, take that weighting and basically drive, you know, use that weight function, and drive that into like a, a deformer, like a delta mush in a specific area. Yeah. So I think that's like a really kind of key thing to kind of remember here with the kind of uh, the, the fall off eval, the component um, fall off and all of these, you can suddenly have like a bit of a, a, um, a round trip into kind of skin weighting and back into fall offs and kind of put and go around with that. So we also loosened up some restrictions so that we, we, we made some new attributes available to make sure some of these wait lists could be passed between traditional deformers. And we also set some things up to where you didn't have to connect them at, you could connect them at the, at the array level, like at the, at the mm. multi-compound level, as opposed to individually, uh, which is something you couldn't have done before 2022. Um, so that, that's some of the other work we've done to enable this, hoping that someone like you would come along and realize that, uh, that, that you could build a, a skin painting workflow using that. <laughs> I found it. Yeah, you, so, you found it. Good job. <laughs> you found the hidden so, gem. <laughs> so what we can basically do here is, I'm just going to take these, and what I'll do is I'll do uh, a bind skin and I will just bind with one max influence and the proximity wrap. And what I'll do is I'll just go and skin with exactly the same kind of joints here now. 
and skin it as a skin cluster instead. So what we actually get now is we get double transformation, right? Because we basically have two deformers doing exactly the same work. So what I can do now is I will reorder these so that I have the skin cluster before the proximity wrap. And I'm going to turn off the skin cluster. So that now we only have the proximity wrap working. And if I jump into the good old node editor, what I'm going to do now is we have the component fall off here, right? And because that's basically the one that gets created. That's where all of these kind of weights get set by default when you do your kind of bind. So what we can do is we can take the skin cluster. And if we open up this, we have the per influence weights that we can take from here and we can connect into our weight layer here. There's that array level collect connection that we made. <laughs> exactly. It's boom, there it is. And what I can do now is I can go in, I can just do my normal right click and because this will now go basically to the skin cluster. So I can now go in and on the shoulder and say, hey, I want to fix up these areas. And again, this is now painting directly onto the proximity wrap. So you can see as I'm driving that. Um, and one thing that if you wanted to go a tiny bit faster, because this is a bit of a hack now, you can just go and paint your skin cluster instead. So you can just go in, do your kind of normal thing here. Uh, I'm just going to make sure that I do that. Go in here. I can flood that. And as soon as I now go turn off my skin cluster, turn back my proximity wrap, and what you just have to kind of watch out for now as well, uh, if you're using the proximity wrap and you go in and you do your kind of uh, weight painting is that you just have to kind of up the number of drivers. So you can see here in the kind of in the back here where I had like kind of smoothing going on between those different. So we just have to make sure that we just kind of have like, if you've got four max influences, you need four drivers because influence yeah, driver. This, the proximity wrap is taking those weights in but it is also normalizing the results. So if you pass in weights that are not normalized against each other, then you will see the proximity wrap modify those weights to, to normalize them. So if you didn't match drivers, you would probably get a different normalization result um, as, as well from the, from the yep. same cluster. So that's basically how you can go in and paint your proximity wrap. And Again, with the proximity wrap, even if you now were to just go in and delete the skin cluster or something and just have those weights in the component fall off, it would just allow for you to go in and change that geometry on the fly, change that org shape and, and just kind of mess about with that and have the weights automatically transfer, automatically transfer for you. So I'm going to tell you two secrets. One secret is your method here. Uh, is slicker than the one I worked on. <laughs> I like it. I, I actually wasn't turning the skin cluster to zero and using that. That's a much more clever uh, uh, use of, of it to get the paint. So congrats on that. And the, the, the second thing is under the hood, when you were binding the skin and you were saying, give me a proximity wrap, no. What it is doing, it is generating a skin cluster. It is taking the results of the skin cluster pushing it into component fall off and blowing away the skin cluster. And we saw so that's why they're matching. Yes. And we talked several times about whether we should provide an option to not blow away the skin cluster. Um, and we chose to blow it away. But if you wanted to play around with it, um, the other thing that we've done that we started doing in 2020 is we started implementing these option boxes in the menu through Python. So mm, yeah. the code to build the proximity wrap bind for the skin cluster is in Python, uh, which it's, it's in an area that's marked internal. And the reason it's marked internal is because we don't want you to build functions that depend on it as if it's a public API, because those things could change. Um, but the logic we're using is all exposed through Python. So for anybody who really wants to have fun and really dig in there, and you like what Matthias is showing here, um, you can potentially go in, look at that function, call that function yourself, uh, or modify it in a way that doesn't blow away that skin cluster and see if you can build a, a, a faster uh, uh, weight painting workflow on top of this using that skin cluster. So just, just some uh, uh, possibilities for some explorations for you. <laughs> Absolutely. So do you have any thoughts on where you would like to see this go or, or 
what, what's, what's, what's next for you? What, what, what are the pieces you would like to see us uh, push forward on to, to kind of complete these workflows for you? So for me, like in terms of this, I think there's a lot of really nice stuff here. I'd really like to see um, like a nice take a bit of step back and and kind of get some updates to the uh, the node editor as well, just to kind of introduce people a bit more into the node editor because I think it's just like it's a bit scary sometimes, and a lot of these things just allow you to you know just have that go in and kind of poke around with these nodes and kind of connect them together. Um, and I, I think that's um, that would be a thing for me. And then kind of continuing on with expanding the number of performers that you can uh, easily kind of push these into. Um, and for me, I'm I'm really curious to see like how much of like USD can be pushed into rigging. And one thing that I'm really, really excited about for the future or like looking into is more composable rigs and not like, I, I loathe, large monolithic files yeah, um, yeah. because it's like the the larger the geometry the slower the time to go in the slower the fixes and um, all of these different things so for me it's a lot of these kind of like kind of base things and then any other cool stuff you guys are cooking up i'm all for it <laughs> cool man well thank you for showing all of this stuff i would Highly recommend that anybody watching this uh follow matthias on twitter uh what's what's your twitter handle it's at, uh, it's at Saitaman. It's basically my name backwards and an E M. So I didn't pick up simple. on that. I didn't pick up on that. All right, cool. So follow Matthias on, on Twitter. Um, that's where I first saw all of these videos. Um, and he linked, he, he was nice enough to put all those together in that post on his website. Be sure to go check out that website. There's some really nice things there. And, and he's really responsive on Twitter to people as well. So we've had some great conversations. And it's been fun to have those conversations in the public where everybody can chime in and learn from each other. So it's, it's, a, it's a really good place to, to have those conversations. And a quick little note on the website as well. Um, a lot of the things that we've kind of gone through here now, I've got example files that people can download um, yes. to kind of test these things as well. So the kind of original one with the kind of scaling cube, I have that exact example. And for the kind of other things I have, not exactly this mesh, but like the standard Maya one. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, everybody. Please go check out his website, download those files, play with these concepts. Um, I think that uh, Matthias has shown us some really creative uses uh, of these. And I think like I told Matthias earlier, um, you know, our goal is to build up these, these modules and these components um, that can be used in different ways. Uh, and, and, and we've made them general purpose on intentionally so that people can do the creative things you're doing. Uh, whereas we never intended somebody to drive that cube example um, it was built so that it could drive things like that. And so it's really neat to see what people are coming up with and ways they can leverage this when we make the outputs and inputs of these different building blocks more general purpose so that they can be consumed and produced uh, and, and used in ways that, that don't necessarily relate to rigging all the time, right? But just relate to uh, data-driven workflows throughout Maya. So um, thank you for showing people how that can be done. And Please continue to work with us so that we can uh, we can keep pushing things forward. And uh, good luck at Rodeo. Can't wait to see what your uh, what your next project or at least your first project coming out of Rodeo looks like. Same. Thank you for having me. It's been uh, it's been fun playing with this, like I said. And yeah, I really hope people dive into it because I literally just did this in a couple of days, poking at these things, and it's really easy to get into as soon as you just kind of click these little things. And I'm super excited to see what people can do with it. Awesome, man. Well, thank you for joining us and thank you everybody for, for logging in. Bye.